time. Welcome to the show, JFK, for the next two hours, folks. Let me set it up. In 1981, a groundbreaking book was released. That book was called Best Evidence. In it, the author, who was our guest tonight, described how the president's body was taken off of Air Force One prior to it arriving at Bethesda, Bethesda Hospital in Maryland for the official autopsy, and instead was kidnapped, if you will, and taken to another institution and manipulated so that whatever the autopsy would reveal would reveal infactual information. That author became a legend in the JFK community. He is our guest tonight. His name is David Lifton. David, I want to welcome you to Night Fright for the very first time. It's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight, sir. How are Thank you? you very much. I'm fine. Thank you very much, Brent. It's great to have you. Let's jump in right away. What led you to believe... We're going to start off this way. What led you to believe that the president's body was indeed lifted off of Air Force One, taken somewhere, all his wounds were manipulated to cover up the evidence, and then taken to Bethesda? My starting point uh, was in uh, October 1966 when I was a graduate student at UCLA, and I discovered an FBI report written by the two agents who were present at the Bethesda autopsy and who in their opening paragraph or first page, whatever, said that when the president's body was removed from the coffin and placed on the table, and now I'm going to quote, it was, quote, apparent that there had been surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. Uh, no such surgery had been done at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Uh, by the way, they didn't just say surgery. They said there was a second wrapping on the head. It was blood-soaked and other such detail. Anyway, no such surgery had been done at Parkland Hospital. And so if that report is true, it was clear that something happened between Parkland and Bethesda. So that was my starting point. And I would just like to uh, say that uh, the word kidnapped, I'm a little bit more conservative because when this, when this book was first published, uh, people thought I was implying that there were some strangers who somehow got onto Air Force One. And, of course, uh, I didn't say that in the book. What I said was, and I clearly implied, was that, uh, was that Secret Service agents, some, had to be involved in covertly removing the president's body from the coffin prior to takeoff. And uh, something happened between the time that plane took off uh, be uh, and the body was no longer in the coffin because when it arrived uh, at Air Force uh, Base in uh, Maryland, uh, that is Andrews, the coffin had to be empty because of the sequence of arrivals at Bethesda with the body arriving 20 minutes before the coffin. But we'll get to that, I'm sure. But anyway, that was when, that's how it began. David, is it your thesis that the Secret Service were involved not only in the assassination that day, but also in the cover-up that took place right after? That some, some agents were, not all by any means, but some, that there were some, uh, let's use, uh, you know, covert tech, you know, terminology. Uh, so there were some people on the Secret Service who were dirty. That is, who were, who were members who were part of or cooperating with a plot to uh, take President Kennedy's life and then change the facts of his death. Are you able to name names, David? Well, I have my own strong opinions, but, I mean, I, I, you know, the guys that were involved, as far as I'm concerned, before, there's a very important distinction between before the fact, people who were involved in the murder plot, and people who were involved after the fact in a cover-up because they're given some story as to why this or that has to be done. And uh, I have my opinions about who took who were involved. The chief of the White House, uh, the detail in Dallas, the chief, uh, the, the senior agent, uh, has to be involved in any of this because he's with the body all the time and there's other reasons that lead me to believe that but uh, you know he was he's now passed away by quite a few years his name is Roy Kellerman mm -hmm. I don't see any way he cannot be involved in this and if he were alive of course we'd want to call him before a grand jury and of course he'd have some explanation for whatever he did but I but I think he would be a, a very important person and there's probably others as well but it's not so much naming names as to understand how this was done, to understand and deconstruct 
the disguise that was used to change the facts of Kennedy's death and mislead all future investigations, all investigations which, following the standard law, legal procedure, uh, relied uh, primarily on the autopsy report, which is called in the law often the best evidence in a murder. And, uh, and by altering the body, they were one step ahead of the autopsy report, because the autopsy report, after all, is simply a typewritten document made by a doctor at the receiving end of the line who receives the body and reports what he sees on the body. If you change those facts on the body, you have, or you have forever changed the facts of a person's murder. If you change Precisely. the wound or remove bullets, stuff like that. What was the first moment for you during the Kennedy assassination? For me, um, I go back to when I was a little kid, and I always remember when Ruby shot Oswald only three days after. Um, that sent off red flags with my parents. What was it for you? Uh, it's a fair question, and uh, my answer is definitely not the standard one. Um, the fact of the matter is that I accepted and went along with and was completely uncritical of the official version uh, probably for a year. So the first moment, there was no such... I experienced all that grief, horror, and shock uh, uh, several years later, but my first moment in terms of starting down that path was a year later in New York City, and it, that's the way page one of my book starts, when I went to a Mark Lane lecture with my parents for my birthday uh, on, in September 1964, and I did it sort of as a lark because I thought that it was kind of silly to think there was a conspiracy in the death of Kennedy. I hadn't looked at any of the facts. I was a student of physics and math, and uh, all I knew was how improbable it would be for, a, for there to be a major plot because there had been so many investigations which had been so much in the news and the, the sheer pro improbability of it. I, you know, I hadn't looked at it at all. So I figured that there was no way in the world there could be a plot. And to me, and I said this on the first page or second page of Best Evidence, that I really approached going to that lecture as kind of a lark that it was like going to a lecture of the Flat Earth Society. Mm, I understand that. And so I went to the lecture, and then, you know, I'm open to facts, and immediately it was very clear that this fellow who was delivering the lecture, Lane, was serious, and he had all these evidence, and I had no idea that this data existed that indicates, that indicated that President Kennedy had been shot from another direction. And I listened to it. I was very uh, concerned about it. Uh, I don't know if I was going to say I was upset by it, but I was really concerned and uh, I had to take a flight back to Los Angeles the next day. I'd been in New York for a family visit, and uh, summer school was starting. I was going to UCLA, and, uh, and I took notes, and I made notes. I think I had a copy of the Warren Report in my hand. As soon as it came out, I bought it at the supermarket, as any American could. There were rows and rows and rows of the Warren Report lining the uh, – today where you buy candy bars or check out you know, right. candy. There were Warren Reports for a dollar. Well, I bought one, and of course – I was making notes about what was in the report versus what Lane had said. And so that's how I got interested. It was like a mystery, uh, really like a Perry Mason mystery. And uh, so that's 1964. It's an entirely – then I go through a couple of stages, and if you can, we can talk about them. Okay, but let's then get I, into it in like, just a second, David. I want to tell folks who are just joining us who we're speaking with and what we're speaking about tonight. Folks, David – Lifton is with us tonight. He wrote that book that you all know if you're into the Kennedy assassination. Groundbreaking work, folks. It's inspired many, many people to search for the truth themselves. That book is called Best Evidence. Easy way to get that book and contact information for David, www.nightfrightshow.com. www.nightfrightshow.com. Mark Lane, folks, very good friend of mine. Mark Lane, of course, um, if you go to the archives at nightfrightshow.com, you're going to find uh, just on the right-hand side, you're going to find a heading called JFK Mark Lane's Shows There. Uh, he wrote the foreword for my new book, which I'm going to plug right now, unabashedly, I'll have you know. <laughs> it's called JFK Assassination, what else? From the Oval Office to Dealey Plaza. And the reason why it's called From the Oval Office, because... I have printed out and done some commentary on the very last interview that Ted Sorensen, yep, the Ted Sorensen, JFK's speechwriter and closest date, he was the guy that wrote the letter to Khrushchev, 
I interviewed him and it turned out to be his last interview and that's going to be made into a documentary as well. Um, all that information is there at www.nightfrightshow.com. Mark Lane was the fellow that brought out Rush to Judgment. That was the first documentary um, that uh, Mark brought forward and said, no, there's something wrong with this. There is something seriously wrong. And then he went on, of course, and he wrote the movie uh, Executive Action. Uh, he was JFK's New York City campaign manager, worked for Dr. King, worked for Bobby. Uh, he survived Jonestown. The show's about David Lifton, so I'm going to stop right there and go back to David. Okay, David, so you're a young guy in university. This thing smells like a rotten fish. What led you to believe that, okay, after you know, another 15 years, let's fast forward to when your book is about to come out. What led you to the research behind that? Was there somebody in specific that said something that said, you know what, two bodies, uh, two uh, coffins arrived that day at Bethesda? Uh, it didn't quite happen that way, but there is, uh, there was a somebody that said something. What happened was, I found the FBI report, and uh, maybe I should back up here just a bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was shown frames of the Zabruder film. Now, the Zabruder film today, everybody knows, you take the, the, inter you, you take the Internet for granted. You say, oh, I'll go on the Internet. I'll look at the Zabruder film. Yeah. That, was, that was not the way it was That's in right. 1964. First of all, there's no Internet. Mm -hmm. Second of all, the Zabruder film was jealously guarded and under lock and key at Life magazine. So all we had were the uh, few frames of the film, a dozen or whatever, 30 frames maximum, that were published in the two or three issues of Life magazine that came out immediately. So I had the film, I had those frames, and it was pointed out to me by a researcher named Ray Marcus, who lives here in Los Angeles and who's now over 80 years old. Anyway, Ray pointed out that if you looked at these frames, you could see that the president's head went backwards in response to the fatal shot. So that, if you're using screen language, screenwriting language, that was my inciting incident. I, I saw the fact that the president's head was thrown backwards, and being a physics major, that was an absolutely impossible for me to believe that he was thrown backwards like that if he was shot from behind. Mm. So that's how it began. I said, this, obviously, there's a lot wrong here. And uh, I, now that's inciting incident one. Inciting incident two was I started to look in the background of photographs to see you know, where that shot came from. So that so, led me mm -hmm. to very serious uh, looking in the background of the Mary Mormon photograph, blowing it up, and of course I th believed I saw images of some people up behind the fence on the knoll, images I still be basically believe in today, even though I have not pursued it anymore in many years. You're referring to badge men? No, 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 not at all. No, uh, uh, in that vicinity, but no, there's a lot of, you know, there's no <laughs> two researchers who agree on the same imagery. Yeah, but I, I, happen, I happen to have a better copy because I was in San Francisco once and um, and uh, the person who was the head of the AP office there was about to throw out these negatives that had been transmitted by wire on November 22nd. And uh, I said, you know, like, are you serious? You're going to throw these away? And he says, yeah, if you want them, take them. So I have them. I have a few of these negatives, and they're a little bit clearer. So, yeah, I have my own images. Wow. And I uh, have not pursued the matter because then other things happen very quickly. And what happened next was I met a professor at the UCLA Law School who had been on the staff of the Warren Commission. Right. And I'm referring here to the late Wesley Liebler. Sure. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a chapter on Oswald's biography. He was immersed in all aspects of the case, but he wrote that chapter. So whereas other people could be furious and complain about the Warren Commission staff, which I originally did also, I ended up walking into his office at the UCLA Law School met the fellow, shook hands, sat down, and he was open to discussion. And that led to a relationship that went on for years. And he actually wanted me to attend his class at UCLA, which I did, on the Warren Commission. So I was able to watch uh, in, in live time, real time, how a Warren Commission attorney thought about this evidence, which I found so completely uh, remarkable and different than my thoughts about it. And what were some of the revelations that came to you from that? Well, the first revelation was, I mean, is it that Liebler, for all his doubts, and I could tell he had doubts, but for all his doubts, mm. he accepted the Warren Commission uh, uh, report's conclusions, and he had answers for everything I would bring up. And it all came down, I have to stress this, and I can't stress it too much, it all came down to this autopsy, mm. this naval autopsy. And I would say to him, his name was Wesley Liebler, 
middle initial J, but we called him, he's called Jim. I said, Jim, you're telling me that the Warren Commission, uh, the President's Commission relied on the U.S. Navy to tell it from where on Elm Street the shots came from, which kind of got a laugh, but it was true. The <laughs> document was the Navy autopsy. Mm -hmm. And he would, and I would argue about whether these doctors could have lied because they had burned an earlier draft of the report, which was certified to in the Warren Commission. That's you right. know, so I knew that the first report, the draft had been burned, and he said that's of no consequence. And then he said that it was ridiculous for me to believe that the autopsy doctors could have lied because they had no way of knowing for sure that the Warren Commission wouldn't be successful in obtaining the uh, x-rays and photographs. And if they lied about the wounds, they'd go to jail. So what, what really was amazing about this, he invited me to attend his class, which I went to twice a week. And what I found was all the, all the students, and there were 15 in a special seminar, they all thought the same way, which led me to my remark in uh, Best Evidence, where I wrote, in order to start with the Warren Commission's evidence and come to the Warren Commission's conclusions, you do not have to be a member of a conspiracy. You just have to have gone to law school. <laughs> that's, that's the way they think, because mm -hmm. they had this whole set of rules, which, was, which I learned and they, and, uh, about by watching them function, and they all... Well, and primarily was this best evidence concept, and the, and the autopsy was considered best evidence. So what it did, it came down to a, this, a discussion and a, and a disagreement over whether these doctors were or were not telling the truth. And I've had many changes of opinions about this over the year, which I can discuss with you a little later in the show. But at the time, he said they were, I said they couldn't be. So then what happened was I said, well, how do you explain the head going backwards? He said, well, yeah. he doesn't have an explanation for it, but he said that whatever it is, you don't rely on a movie film to determine where a shot comes from. When there's a murder, you go to the autopsy report. That's the way a lawyer thinks. Okay, so I got into that mode of thinking where it's supposed to ignore this film, right, which was physics, as far as I was concerned, and you don't ignore that. But okay, let's put that aside. So I started thinking... physics, right? Back and to the left, yeah. Yeah, so I started thinking, okay, well, how could they possibly be an explanation uh, in which right, that is in which the autopsy doctors would not have to lie in order to have them write a report that said the president was struck from behind even if I stress even if he'd been struck from the front and it was that kind of reasoning which comes right out of a logic class or a math class or whatever that led me to say wait a minute implicitly I said to myself, and I didn't use, I didn't articulate this this way, I'm doing it on this radio show, but implicitly I said, the best evidence is really not the autopsy report, it's the body of the president about which the report is written. Precisely. I mean, so I had to understand that. So then what happened is, I said, just a minute, in my own head, and I said, Where, how did the body get to the hospital? Where was it in all those hours? So, you know, I quickly... Uh, you know, we kept that in my mind that it came in by plane. And then I grabbed the FBI report, which had just been published in the appendix to a couple of paperback books, uh, like the second Oswald or Epstein's book called Inquest. And that report had just been released at the National Archives and had been found. The uh, first person to come across it, I think, was uh, JFK researcher Paul Hoke, who lives in Berkeley and lived then in Berkeley, and he had distributed it to the, uh, the others on the, uh, on the grapevine, you might say. Was there the one others. thing out of the other, uh, over all the others, that stood out for you from that autopsy report and said, wait a second, we can obviously see this isn't what happened on the Sapruder film. How did we get from the Sapruder film to what, to, this, to what this autopsy report is saying? Because we know this is impossible for this to have happened this way. Was there one thing in specific in that autopsy report? Well, again, it was not the autopsy report. Remember, I started with the FBI report of the autopsy. So from the Siebert agents, and O'Neill? Yeah, from Siebert and O'Neill. So okay. those two agents said it was apparent that there had been surgery in the head area, and that's when my, I mean, I, I really, it was just astounding. It was one of those major aha moments, and it was both scary, frightening, and enlightening all mixed together because I mean, the idea of even touching the president's body, to me, the president's body goes into a coffin. There's a flag-draped coffin. He's buried at Arlington. All of that symbology was ingrained into me, and I understood it. And the notion that anybody would do anything to the body was just completely foreign to my way of thinking until I found that FBI report. That's when I, 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 I don't want to say I freaked out, but it was amazing, and I was scared and enlightened at the same time, 
And I said, okay, that's the explanation. Somebody touched the body. Somebody altered the body. Mm. And so um, I believe that happened on a Friday night. I spent most of the next day uh, – I mean, what I wanted to do, of course, was immediately bring it to Liebler's attention, uh, that report. But more than that, I wanted to look into this. So now I opened up the 26 volumes, went back to the autopsy report, and – to the autopsy testimony, and this is laid out in chat in my book, Best Evidence, this path of discovery, where immediately, once you're uh, onto this way of thinking at it, you start to look at Commander Hume's testimony completely differently because he can be describing accurately a body which perhaps has been altered or cut into, and he's putting in phraseology and statements to protect himself from, let's say, future prosecution because it's like a, a teller at a bank who cashes a forged check. And the question then became, will this teller know that he's being handed a forged instrument? Did he know he's, he's cashing a forgery? Was so that's complicit. what happened. Huh? Yeah. Was he complicit? Yeah, was and, he complicit? And we know because um, I had Dr. Robert McClelland on the show, folks, and he worked on JFK at Parkland. We know what he witnessed and what the yeah. autopsy photo shows are not the same thing at all. Right, but, but then th this is where I guess my training in math or physics or whatever came in useful because I viewed this almost immediately as a before and after condition on the body. So just like in the weight loss advertisements, you see the person, you know, and they weigh yeah. 185 pounds, and then after the diet they weigh 150 or whatever. Here the question was, okay, with all due respect to Dr. McClelland, uh, and it wasn't the same, and I too interviewed McClelland on camera and all that many years ago, the fact is, the, the Bethesda doctors would have no way of knowing what the Dallas doctors saw. The question is, for the Bethesda doctors, did they know there had been cutting, that there had been damage on the body which was not caused by a bullet? That was the key question. So immediately it became important to compare Dallas and Bethesda. Now, this took me a long time, and I was not prepared to be able to do this in 24 hours because you got all the Dallas doctors and I don't want to tell you what starts to happen when you start to collect all this testimony, get it all photocopied, start to compare. But I had one day, I wanted to meet with Liebler. And uh, the next day on Sunday, I think it was October 23rd it was, we were on a TV show together. And, of course, now I had the answer to the puzzle. And he, he went through his usual routine taunting me on the TV show. It was called the Louis Lomax show. And he was saying, well, Mr. Lifton, if there's bullets from the front, where'd they go? You know, what happened to them? Did they just disappear? And, of course, I didn't want to give away my new insights on a TV program like that. Uh, and so I did the best I could. It's all described in my book. And then I went up, up to him after the show, and I said, look, we have to meet because I found something really new. And so he didn't question me. He said, okay, where do you want to meet? And when? Or I said, tomorrow. So he set aside several hours the next day, not in his office, but in the law office of attorney Joe Ball, uh, in Los Angeles, Ball was a fellow Warren Commission attorney, and he had, had a big office in Beverly Hills. And so the next day, let's say one or two in the afternoon, we met at the law offices of Joe Ball in a big conference room. And I can describe that next, what happened when I revealed to Liebler for the first time that this FBI report said there had been surgery. And I'd like to get into that now because that's how it all began. That was the big turning point when I saw his reaction. Okay, to hold on to that for a second. Just let me tell folks who we're speaking with. Folks, the book is called Best Evidence, of course. It is a groundbreaking work that was brought out by our guest tonight, David S. Lifton. Now, this book, folks, was so instrumental. You know, I've had guest after guest after guest on the JFK assassination on, and they all reference David's book as inspirational that drove them to ask why, how, and who was behind the Kennedy assassination. If you've never read the book, you are doing yourself a disservice because this is one of the pillars that we all stand on. www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover, Best Evidence. That'll take you right to a spot where you can order it from the comfort of your own home. You don't even have to get up out of your chair. How great is that, modern technology? And, you know, we had alluded to this before. David's research, don't forget, folks, before the Internet, when you just couldn't go to Google and type in something and get a 1,000 matches, we're talking snail mail. It may take a week or two to get information from one side of the country to the other, and then you have to physically go through it, make your notes, and then shift it back again for another appraisal. 
this was painstaking work in those days, folks, uh, and it is today, no question at all. www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover, Best Evidence. We're speaking with David S. Lifton. A couple of numbers for you, because I know there's a lot of you out there that want to call in and ask David some questions. Um, easiest way is through Skype, folks, and the Skype address for the show is Freedom Screen 2. Now, 2 is the number 2. So I'll spell that out, F-R-E-E-D-O-M-S-C-R-E-E-N-2. All that is, there's no spaces, there's no dots, there's no hyphens. It's all a single word, Freedom Screen 2. That's via Skype. If you have a telephone, the telephone number is 310 Four zero five three three one zero four two one four zero five three, and of course Skype Freedom Screen too, and I'll put you right on to David. You can speak to the legend himself. <laughs> well, okay, <thank> let's <laughs> let's jump. Let's go right back. So we're sitting at the table at this law office. Now you've got lawyers in front of you. No, one lawyer. One lawyer. Okay, so what happened next? Okay, well what happens is we we go in. I have or oh, by this time I've prepared. And I've, I've read the testimony very carefully, and I've already found passages in the testimony which indicate to me that Humes, Dr. Commander Humes, the autopsy surgeon, has an awareness that has been cutting, and he's sliding this by the commission. This is my original concept. By the way, I have to add very emphatically, uh, my concept has changed uh, today. We can get to that later. I have much more reason to believe that Humes was um, deliberately uh, covering up and... Uh, what he called, he was not totally in a, uh, deceived. He was not a, a, the victim of a perfect deception, but rather he knew what was going on. And I have other reasons to believe that some of this may have been shared with Arlen Specter. But we'll get to that later. Let me go okay. back to October 66. So um, we went through uh, our little song and dance, which we always did in the beginning of the conversation. And he's always challenging me, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, really? You know, and what do you, how do you claim, what's, where, where are these bullets that you think were fired from the grassy knoll? So uh, I said, oh, that's simple, Jim. He says, he, he, so I got up from my chair and went around to his chair, which was on the opposite side of the table. And I said, now I'm using the word they. I said, they simply opened up the head and I put, drew my finger across the top of his scalp. And I, you know, standing behind him like a barber. And I said, they simply opened up the head, reached in and took the bullet out. Hmm. And then he's this silence and he's looking at me as if I'm absolutely crazy and I walked back to my seat and I picked up the copy I had of the FBI report and I said and that's why the FBI reported when the body arrived that there had been surgery of the head area namely in the top of the skull mm -hmm. and there's this moment of pause and he slams his fist down on the table I mean the kind of slamming down where you make you know your fork and knife if you're sitting down to dinner you would make them jump off the napkin uh, he slammed his fist down and said where does it say that Huh. He was in total denial and disbelief. I mean, first of all, and reasonably so, because they had all these reports. Where does it say that? And I said, right here in the Siebert and O'Neill FBI report. And I tossed either the book or the copy of the report I had across the table at him. And he picked it up and he looked at it. And now he's looking at the FBI report of the two agents who attended the autopsy. And there's just total silence for a few seconds. I don't know how many seconds, but he's reading it. And then he looks at me and he says, do you realize what you found? You found new evidence. Bingo. 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 It was yeah. a very big bingo moment because yeah. all the public challenges were, where is the evidence? These people claim there's a conspiracy. You know, and I knew, and, and Liebler is not just any old lawyer. He wrote a portion of the report. He was up to his neck in the report. He was immersed in it. It was the major experience in his life. And whether he had second thoughts about it, you know, reservations. The fact is he followed the, the orthodoxy of a lawyer who followed the evidence and he understood how it worked and how their system and the legal mind worked. And here is this guy who's 20, what was I then, uh, 20, 19, uh, 26 years old, Just who's a, mm -hmm. a, a graduate student in physics. And my discipline, physics, logic, and math, led me to something that he, with his discipline and his wonderful legal education, University of Chicago Law School and all the rest of it, he didn't find this. Nobody found it. But I found this thing. And he says, you found new evidence. David, well, did you ever ask Liebler to try and square away the fact that there were several 
dissenting members that were very hesitant on signing the Warren report. I talk, of course, of um, oh, um, not Hale Boggs, the other fella. Oh, I see his name. Yes, but, Richard, thank Richard. you very much, my friend. I forgot his name there for a second. And even you know, even uh, the president at the time, Johnson, said he didn't believe the single bullet theory for a second. Yeah. Well, the, the, How the did short answer, get, Yeah. Go ahead, please. The short answer to your question is no. I did not because we're okay. now in, we're now in a different universe. We're now talking about what I now call, and Doug Horn calls, I, I coined this whole thing, fraud in the evidence. Mm -hmm. we're, in a different, we're in a different universe here. We're suddenly entering the universe of fraud in the evidence. But what happened next was, and I think this will answer your question, mm -hmm. well, first thing he does, first of all, he's pacing up and down, and he's really upset about this. And he calls up, he calls up a woman who was the top student in his law school class and who he married either a year later or two years later. And her name uh, was Susan Wittenberg. And she became Susan Liebler, but he calls her up. And I mean, I'm right there watching this conversation. And he says, I want you to get over here right away. Uh, Lifton's found surgery. Now, that whole cryptic remark always puzzled me how he would sum it up that way in one word for her. So it led me later to believe that he had had this idea somewhere in the back of his mind that the only way to explain his autopsy would be if somebody did something to the body. Now, that's one thing he did. But the other thing, the first thing he did, and maybe I've got my sequence incorrect, the first thing he did was call a doctor. He called up a doctor in Long Beach, California, who was a pathologist he knew. I think I called him Joe in the book, and I think I remember his name was, first name Joe, and all I heard was one side of the conversation. And he calls up his doctor and says, Joe, I want to read you the description of a brain, because I had read, showed Lee these peculiar passages, or to me were peculiar, in the autopsy report about the brain, the supplemental report, which looked to me like cutting, of linear, linear incision from back mm -hmm. to front, from the tip of the occipital lobe to the tip of the frontal lobe, says the report written by Hume. So he calls him up, he reads him, and he says, I want to read you a description of the brain. Please tell me what you believe the cause of death to be. He reads him the description of the brain, and there's this pause. And then I can't hear what's going on on the other end of the line, but Libra's face flushes like a little bit red. And he says, well, okay, thank you very much. And then he says, the guy asked him a question. He said, well, what does it matter whose brain it is? I don't care whose brain it is. I'm just asking you this simple question. And that's when he says whatever he said. And he, Libra says, thank you. And then Libra looks at me and he says, Sounds like he was hit by an axe. Sounds like blur, and you know, like our eyes lock. You might say this is a moment, and and I said, what are we going to do? And he says, and he had this incredible black humor. He says, I guess the FBI is going to have to jimmy up some evidence that Oswald ordered an axe. <laughs> but that's the line. I guess the FBI is going to have to jimmy up some evidence that Oswald ordered an axe. I mean, I think that's when he called Susan. But then the next call he makes is to Arlen Specter. And he Tell the folks up. who Arlen Specter is if okay. you don't Arlen know. Specter, the work on the commission was divided up into six or seven areas, and there were 14 staff attorneys. Liebler was one of them. Specter was in charge of the medical area. So uh, he, he basically was in charge of the whole medical area, which is why he is called the father of the single bullet theory. Uh, so Liebler didn't want me to hear that phone call. So he goes into another room. And... And he's on the phone for about five or ten minutes, and he's calling Arlen Specter. I mean, this is really a big moment. Mm -hmm. And he comes out, closes his oak door or something, and he says, uh, you know, I said, well, what did he say? What did he say? And he didn't want to tell me. But then he, I said, what did he say, Jim? And he says, Specter hopes he gets through this with his balls intact, Jeez. quote, unquote. Now, that's in my book. I quoted all this stuff in Chapter 9 of my book where I describe this remarkable day, October 24th, 1966, which I think I called the chapter A Confrontation with Liebler. So that's the way this began. It was a courted belief. It was a courted belief, credence. They had gotten to the body. At some point in there, Susan arrived, and she says things. I mean, what, the conversations that day, I wish I had every one of them on tape. I do not. But what Liebler did do was he made notes as I talked. So he said to me, because he realized where this was going, so as I asked these questions, and before we reach the moment of surgery, he says, David, do you mind if I make some notes here? I said, not at all, Jim. So he takes out this yellow legal pad, he's making notes, and we get to about halfway through this conversation when I come to the surgery, the head area, and you know, he's making these notes, and I have a record of what he wrote, because he accidentally left that sheet of paper in my copy of the Warren Report, the volume two uh, Hume's testimony. So I not only have the notes I brought to the room, in which I did verbatim to him, I have the notes he made as I talked, which is why I was able to write such a good chapter nine about this interaction between 
myself and Liebler on October 24th, 66. So I said, what are we going to do? Meanwhile, Susan arrived, and she says things like, um, David, do you realize how famous Jim is going to be when he reveals this to the world? I mean, there's all this going on. I mean, I didn't know that Jim would, you know, not want to reveal this to the world a little while later, but that's another story. It's got, this has several layers. So, so uh, what are we going to do? So he calls up another attorney, Bert Griffin. And Bert Griffin acted a little differently. Now, I, from what I know, I, I think I may have spoken to Bert Griffin once, maybe. He's, he's a nice fellow and everything, but he was definitely raining on my parade. Uh, he wanted to know, well, how did I know that this statement was true? How did I know why they wrote this? You know, he was going through the whole, you know, cross-examination routine, the way lawyers think. Okay, so that passed. I think he also called, yes, he did. He called Joseph Ball, whose office he was really using for this, obviously, this whole conference. And I remember that call very clearly because Ball didn't get it. And, and, but I remember what he said to Ball. One of his closing lines was, Joe, did you ever get the feeling we were, late, we were being led down the garden path? Mm. And that's a really important concept to understand that all these lawyers were being led around by the nose by this evidence which had been falsified if this concept was true. And now, I kind of emphasize you can't just go from one line in an FBI report to the whole idea of body alteration, interception, yeah, that, that takes months, if not years, of research. But I understood where this was leading. I understood where this was going to lead if it was true. Uh, David, and just I let me interject here something. Yeah. Um, this is directly – I'm going to quote from my own book, and this is the research that I found out. Are you ready for this, folks? This was quoted specifically from the Warren Commission report. Now listen to this. Although it is not necessary – to any essential findings of the Warren Commission to determine just which shot hit Governor Connolly. In other words, what they're saying here is it doesn't matter where the shots came from. All I had to prove that Oswald was the one who pulled the trigger. The trigger. They didn't go any further than that. Now, this is a list of people who didn't believe the Warren Commission. And that's Georgia Senator Richard Russell, and he was a Warren Commission member, member as well. Another Warren Commission member, Louisiana Congressman Hale Boggs. Kentucky Senator John Cooper, another Warren Commission member. J. Edgar Hoover in the FBI didn't believe it. Hoover had signed off on the FBI's official report sent to the Warren Commission that stated there were only three shots. The first shot, now this is the first Warren Commission, folks, before James Tate came forward. God love him. Rest in peace, James. He just passed away. The first had hit Kennedy in the back. The second had hit Connolly sitting directly in front of him. And the third and final shot had hit Kennedy in the head. So... There we go. Now, we just talked about the Secret Service. They didn't believe it as well. Uh, Texas Governor John Connolly didn't believe it. Uh, Nellie Connolly didn't believe it. And uh, you mentioned FBI agent James Siebert. Here's a quote from James Siebert, folks. There's no way that bullet could go that low, then come up, rise up, and come out the front of the neck, zigzag and hit Connolly, and then end up in pristine condition over there in Dallas. His partner, FBI agent Frank O'Neill, now both these guys were at the autopsy. We just referenced them before, by the way. Absolutely not. It did not happen. So there you have it, folks. And that's from, uh, I'm going to unabashedly plug that book again, folks. J.F. Kennedy assassination, J.F.K. assassination from the Oval Office to Daly Plaza. So, you know, there's more confirmation that there was something mysterious and kooky going on. So uh, there you are. Um, we've got a, a question, uh, a phone call from, um, I'm just looking for his name here. Oh, there he is. Okay, it's Bill from Nevada. Bill, would you like to interject and ask a question to David? David, Bill, and Angela from South Lake Tahoe. How are you doing? Fine, fine. Hi, David. Hi there. I, I, I want everybody to know out there that you're talking to a great historian here tonight. And uh, but uh, uh, David, uh, you're you're. I want you to uh, when you get a chance. I want you to tell everyone about the South County uh, informant, the 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 young, you know. Uh, Corman, who you know, uh, told you that you know the body came in in a in a crash bag, in a in a metallic uh, gray. Uh, Apollo Connor. 
And I, well, uh, that, there's there are several witnesses. We haven't gotten to that point in the narrative yet. I, sure. I understand. I want you to make sure you, you, you don't pass that up. Okay? Well, let, let's jump into that right now because well, that question was just asked, and we'll come back. How's that? Uh, fair enough if you want to do it that way. Yeah. I, well, actually, I prefer to do it the other way. I prefer to uh, tell you what happened next with Liebler because something very important happened. Okay, go ahead then. then we, okay. What happened was Liebler decided to write a memorandum to Chief Justice Warren, and it is very important to know this. So he wrote a memorandum to Warren with copies to every member of the Warren Commission, plus President Johnson, plus the Kennedy family. It's a 13-page memo. It's dated November 8, 1966. It was transmitted to all these people on uh, November 16th, 1966, and it spells out all the problems with the autopsy as he now understood them, and he includes a full page on my discovery, naming me by name, not in a footnote, right there in the text, as a discoverer of this statement in the FBI report. Basically, this memo spells it out and says, look, there's a kid here in California, my student, who found this evidence that the body's been altered. That's what it's really saying. What are we going to do about it? And this went to everybody on the commission. Seven members, 14 staff members, Bobby Kennedy's attorney, um, Burke Marshall. And furthermore, um, there's even more to the story here. It went to all these people. And he was in touch with Ed Guffman, who was a friend of Bobby Kennedy. I now know. I didn't know all these things at the time. But he would always say, I spoke to Eddie Guffman today, this or that. So people have ignored this memo, which is amazing to me. I got a copy of it recently sent to me from the National Archives. I had my copy, for my own copy for years, but I got the official copy from the National Archives. And it's amazing to me to ignore this and try to pretend that the Warren Commission members had not been put on notice as of November 1966 that this crucial piece of evidence in the case against Oswald, in the case, in their whole reality, was falsified, was fraudulent. And they knew it. They knew that, now I'm not saying they all understood it, like Joe Ball didn't understand it. He said to me, when he got off the phone with Ball, Joe Ball's a dope. He said that to me. Joe Ball's a dope. I think I put that in the book, too. Our inspector, on the other hand, got it. He said, I hope I get through this with my balls intact. And there were others. I don't know how each one, obviously, people like Alan Dulles, the commissioner, he would get it. He would understand. Mm -hmm. And it, I've never went through the project of going through each of the copies of the memo. One went to Dulles. You know, one went to Richard Russell in Georgia to where these men have their papers, to see what they marked in the margin of the memo as they read this stuff and who got it and who didn't. I never did that. Some of these documents weren't even available for decades. They were at libraries like Dulles' papers are at Princeton. Okay, now back to your question. Mm -hmm. we, we went through this uh, on, November, on October 24th, uh, uh, 1966, and the next question became, you know, where did they do this or who did it? What is the extent of this? What other wounds were altered? And then there's a whole chapter or two in events where I am calling the Dallas doctors to see what they say about the wounds and asking new questions which were never asked by the commission, comparing it to the Bethesda report, persuading myself, and certainly I was absolutely convinced now that the body had been altered. And the question was, wh where and when? Because I knew that if you couldn't prove that there'd been an intercept no one would believe the anatomic evidence of alteration. People would say, oh, come on, you know. So these people have these inconsistencies in their descriptions. How could this have happened? So I knew I had to find evidence of this. And this went on, I'm just going to tell you right now, for years and years, my, uh, my starting point originally were the members of the casket team that the whole nation saw bury Kennedy at, 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 at Arlington National Cemetery. Mm -hmm. I located them, I interviewed them, wow. and that's discussed in Chapter 16 of Best Evidence, where I learned that when the, when the plane arrived, there was a decoy ambulance, and there's all this deception going on, and that was my first attempt to put together where this had happened and how this had happened. Now, what your caller, Bill, just called about was what happened in 1979, which is a full 13 years later, when I really got to the bottom of this mystery, and that is that the body had been removed from the coffin before takeoff in Dallas. Now, how did I learn that? Well, what happened was that there was a person named Dennis David, and Dennis David was the officer of the day at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and he had told a newspaper in 1975, a local newspaper in Illinois, that when the president's 
uh, when the naval ambulance from Bethesda, from Air, Andrews Air Force Base, pulled up at the front of Bethesda Naval Hospital, there had already been a delivery of the body to the rear in a black hearse. He mentioned this, but he did not really understand the significance of it because he believed it was a, some kind of a security measure because that's what he oh, and I, I guess see. others were told that well we're bringing the body in by the back door but the you know see Jackie arrive in his naval vehicle in the front but anyway so I didn't understand what that completely meant either by the way except that I knew it was darned important so then the question became and again this is in the days before the internet how do you find Dennis David I mean you go try to find someone in the United States there's no Google there's no way to search. There's no intranet. What do you do? And I'm telling you that that was a very, very serious problem. Am I gonna, am I gonna publish my book, which was due in a few months? Was I gonna publish my book without having some background on this interview from this man? Who was this man? Try to look up a person. His name was like Smith. I mean, <laughs> Dennis David. I mean, it's impossible to find a name like that. Which of the fifty states does he live in? Yeah, precisely. It was amazing. So anyway, this went on and on. And a friend of mine was in the military reserve, and he got someone in the Pentagon to pull some string. Uh, anyway, I found out where he lived, which was in a very small town in Illinois. And it was the kind of town I used to joke when I finally went and visited him there a year later or something. I mean, like it had one stoplight. He lived in a rural area. And he was, you know, he was possessed of this really critical information, if it was true. Anyway, I got him on the phone on July in July, I think it was July 2nd, 1979. And I have a whole chapter about him. Mm -hmm. And yes, I recorded the conversation. It's crystal clear. And he went through the whole thing with me. And on the phone, I learned for the first time what this was really all about. And how serious it was that this black hearse had arrived at the back of the hospital with the body, that he was there, or he knew about it, he was there. He's overseeing a group of men who helped or assisted in unloading the, the, uh, ship, the casket from the hearse. And it was a shipping casket. So the timing of this, David, is crucial because right. if they both arrive at the same time, uh, obviously the press is going to be, be wandering around. They might find out what's happening at the back of Bethesda. So obviously, what type of time frame are we looking at between okay. the arrival of the black one and the arrival of Jackie in the front? Okay, let's start with Jackie in the front. Okay. According to the Secret Service reports and according to the Associated Press, who was there in the Washington Post and all that at the front, the uh, Naval Ambulance, which left Andrews Air Force Base at 6.10. The plane comes in at 6 o'clock, offload, 6.10, we're in the Navy Ambulance, arrives at the front of Bethesda Naval Hospital at 6.53 or 6.55. Take your choice whether you're dealing with the Secret Service reports or the wire service. Two minutes difference. So Naval Ambulance pulls up with Jackie, Bobby, uh, Secret Service agents, Dr. Berkeley, and the big Dallas coffin. That occurs at about, you know, 6.53, 6.55. She gets out and goes into the hospital with Bobby, and they go up to the 17th floor. Now, Dennis David tells me that about 20 minutes before, he doesn't, he doesn't have a document to say this. This is De Dennis David on the phone with me on July 2nd, 19. 79 okay and he says 20 minutes before this black hearse arrives at the back entrance and entering bethesda from a rear gate so it enters at bethesda from a completely different entrance to the uh, facility let's say uh, one half of an acre away uh, the naval ambulance came down wisconsin avenue a major thoroughfare and came in the main front gate this came up the back entrance of bethesda uh, 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 through an inch, through an, onto a road called Jones Bridge Road. So, uh, you know, I had to get out my maps. I had to learn about this. But he went through this whole thing. So it's 20 minutes time difference. Mm. And this critical time difference became important. Secondly, became important is that he described it as a shipping casket. You know, the kind the military is sure. to ship a body from Vietnam. Um, he does not go inside the autopsy room. This is very important. Dennis David's view of these events is at the rear loading dock. And then up to the into the hallway, and up to the doorway to the morgue. Can that, I stop you there that, for a second, David? I just want to clarify. Dennis David was told he was aware that that shipping casket, the one you described, that could have been used from Vietnam. He was told the president's body was in there. He never. Yes, he was told time. that because he had. You know, they went to the cafeteria afterwards, and I, I put I this see. in the book. Uh, he was speaking to Dr. Boswell, who apparently knew about the multiple arrivals. Huh. 
said something like, well, you were there, you know, it came in the first one. Uh, so that's number one. You have to know is that there was a, tw and it was a 20 minute time gap. And here's what's really important. When you say, well, how do I know about 20 minutes? Because after he was witness to all this, he then went up to the main lobby of the hospital, went to the front, and then witnessed the arrival of the naval ambulance whose time of arrival is a matter of public record, like I said, mm -hmm. 6.53 or 6.55. So Dennis David emphasized to me that there was a 20-minute thing, but he didn't see. When we spoke on the phone in July 1979, he did not understand that there was a theft of the body or anything happened to the body or any of it. He was just speaking to a young man, myself, who was calling him, trying to clear up a loose end because, and I forget what I told him, probably that I was writing a book or something, but I don't remember exactly. It's all there on the tape, and I put those tapes. They've been transferred to CD-ROM, and I think they're part of, I mean, I've made them, but I haven't lifted the seal on them um, at the National Archives because I'm writing this, you know, I'm writing more about the subject. But anyway, I put it in verbatim in my book. They were absolutely accurately transcribed. So the reader of my book learns on Chapter 25 of what happened that night. Now, that's the beginning of this, of this, okay? That's just the beginning. Now we have to move forward two months to August, okay, 1979. What happened is a few days after I spoke to Dennis David, the House Select Committee releases their report. Now, that's the Blakey, you know, General, uh, you know, General Counsel Blakey's investigation, the, what we call the HSCA, House Select Committee on Assassinations. That report is released, and... In chapter, in volume seven of that report, are the names of the people in the autopsy. And this is in chapter 26 of Best Evidence. And um, what do you know? Uh, of course, they don't mention Dennis, Dennis David. They didn't even know about him. But they did have the people who were inside the room whose names were noted by the FBI. They had found every one of them. There was a, It turns out there was a Navy file of who was in the room. They found him. And they stated Paul O'Connor says that President Kennedy's body arrived in a body bag. That's right there in the House Select Committee report. I could not believe it. So now I not, not only had the time of arrival from Dennis David, that is approximately 635, 640, um, but I also had this thing about Paul O'Connor. So I called up Andrew Purdy, who, who was the attorney been in charge of the Medical Committee. In other words, in 1963 and 4 with the Warren Commission, we had Arlen Specter. Now, you might say, if you were sitting, you'd say, son of our inspector, we have Andrew Purdy in 1979. <laughs> David, we've only got three minutes before the break, so I sure. get, let's, let's cut to the chase, shall we? Okay. Um, what's the chase? okay. I say, did you know that the body, write this down. And he said, if he said body bag, just tell, tell me about O'Connor. He said, if he said, if I wrote body bag, he said body bag. I said, Andy, do you know what a body bag is? And he says, no, what's a body bag? I mean, can you believe this? The head of a homicide investigation doesn't know what a body bag is? I said, Andrew, that's not the way the president's body left Dallas. It left wrapped in sheets. I mean, that's what happened then. And I said, you've got to help me find O'Connor. Where does he live? Turns out that O'Connor lived in Florida in a, in a trailer park. Shady Nook Lane or something. I mean, he helped me find the guy, and that's what happens next, and that's the next chapter of Best Evidence when I call up O'Connor and he tells me all about the crash bag. Okay, so let's just let's just um, compress everything we've talked about for the last hour. We're aware now that the best part, I guess, the best part of of the story is the fact that. The body has been altered somehow before it got to Bethesda in order to cover up the real wounds, according to your thesis. Yes. So when we come back, we're going to break that down. We're going to accept calls. We're going to have people calling in asking various questions, and uh, David, and uh, we're going to be looking at um, the logistics of it all and how, and how you feel that uh, we could prove that the body was uh, altered before Bethesda. Um, you know, the physics of it all, how, where and how and how the body could have sure. been flown away and those type of things. Folks, don't go anywhere because after the break, man, we're going to get down to it and break into it. But this is amazing stuff from a legend in the JFK community. His name is David S. Lifton. The book, of course, is Best Evidence, www.nightfrightshow.com. We will be back uh, just after the break.
in about six minutes. If you're at the nightfrightshow.com website, just click on tonight's guest book cover. As with all our guests, the book covers are there. You can order them from the comfort of your own home. And I'm going to ditch this cat, <laughs> which was a big mistake letting her in the studio tonight. Uh, she was asleep when we started. We'll be back in six minutes, folks. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back, folks. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. Thanks for joining us. Get the coffee going, folks. Get the tea going or a beverage of your choice going. Uh, we've got a great guest with us tonight. He's a legend in the JFK research community. His name is David S. Lifton. His book is called Best Evidence. You've probably heard of that if you're at all familiar with the Kennedy assassination and have been following with the research over the years. It is a groundbreaking work, folks. It was released in 1981. It was uh, re-released, I think, the third or fourth edition. David will tell me in a second. Uh, I think 1988. It has inspired thousands of people to search for the truth behind the Kennedy assassination for themselves. And kudos to David. Thank you for coming on the show. www.nightfrightshow.com. As always, folks, if you're just joining us, you can always get the guest's book by just going to the Night Fright Show website and clicking on the guest book cover associated with the guest. And that'll take you right to a spot always where you can purchase the book online. Um, let's go back to David. Now, just to wrap up, we were at a point, folks, where David had explained very clearly how he feels that the body was altered before the official autopsy took place. And I say official because that is the document. Those were the documents that were released to the Warren Commission in order for the Warren Commission to formulate their conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald was the only shooter in Dealey Plaza that day. Now, we know that's not true for a whole bunch of reasons. For one thing, this is a fruiter film. But now we have new evidence that David brought forward in the guise of two FBI agents that were present at the autopsy and both said the body looked like it had been operated on already before it had reached Bethesda. Now, we know no operation took place at Parkland Hospital where the body was first rushed where JFK was still alive, it was first, he was first rushed to Parkland Hospital. So somewhere between Parkland Hospital and Bethesda, that body was taken and altered. And that's where we're going to go now. David, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around for the second hour. Let's jump sure. in right away. Where was the body taken in your estimation? Was it ever in the coffin that we've seen dragged up those stairs to Air Force One? Was it taken perhaps after that aircraft left? Perhaps it remained in Dallas and was taken later? No, no. The body was in okay. the coffin when it left Parkland Hospital. And there's an uninterrupted chain of evidence from Parkland over five or ten minutes to Love Field. I see. And then you can see the body being brought up the steps. And the big agent at the front is Roy Kellerman leading the way. Big six-foot-plus guy. Right. Um, bringing the coffin onto the airplane. That coffin is put on the airplane. I think the time is uh, 2.14, uh, two 2.18. And then uh, the, the Kennedys board the plane, Jackie, and then they're told there has to be a delay. Yeah. They want to know why. Well, Johnson supposedly has been told by Robert Kennedy he should be sworn in. That turns out to be a lie, an absolute falsehood, but that's what Johnson was saying. And then everybody should come to the front of the plane for the swearing in. And then the swearing in is at 2.38, and then everybody goes back to their seats, and the Kennedy party goes back to the little tail compartment where the coffin was, and I'm telling you that by that time the coffin was empty. Ah. And then the plane takes off at 2.47, and so we're flying to the East Coast with an empty coffin. And the question then becomes, of course, how did the coffin get empty? Precisely. And where did the body go and all that sort of thing. And I just want to tell any listener to this is that um, this took years to really figure out. There were so many possibilities. The body could be taken off the plane and brought to another aircraft at left field. It might have been brought to Carswell Air Force Base. There's so many things that I considered 
And the, can you really prove where that body went? All we know is that it was altered, but it took years. But I'm telling you that I know the answer, and I don't want to drag everybody through the zigzag process it took to find answers. But I'm telling you the body did not leave Love Field, did not go on another aircraft, did not go on Air Force Two. There's witnesses and all kinds of things that I did to rule these things out. And finally, there was a bingo moment, which we I don't want to get into all of that detail right now. It's too lengthy in detail. But, yes, the body is on Air Force One, and it's in one of the luggage holds, probably the forward luggage area. And that's So at the time that plane took off, that body had been removed from Air Force One on the other side of the plane, not the side you see Kellerman dragging it up on. That's the port side. It had been removed on the starboard side. And as I said in my, part, in my uh, speech at Bismarck State College in November, you can find it by just Googling David Lifton at Bismarck. There it is. I talk about how it was taken off via a forklift truck, and uh, something happened to the body right away at Love Field. And then we have the body in luggage flying to the East Coast. And then there's a whole mystery of how the body gets offloaded from Air Force One without being seen by the press. Precisely. That's another mystery, which I've solved, but I didn't talk about it at Bismarck. And then we have the body coming into Bethesda Naval Hospital, having already been altered. Now, I'm not going to rule out that there wasn't more work done at Bethesda. That's another situation, a very interesting footnote to this discussion. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the, then the body comes in, as I said, uh, at uh, when Dennis David sees it 20 minutes before. And we left out, and I want to put in right here, that Dennis David was a recollection of 20-minute delay between the time the body arrived in the Black Hearse and the time he saw the Navy ambulance arrive. However, in 1998, when the Assassination Records Review Board was doing its work, they uh, were able to retrieve, discover and retrieve a document written by the sergeant who was in charge of the Marine Security Detail. His name is Boyajan, B-O-Y-A-J-I-A-N. And Boyajan, Sergeant Boyajan, wrote a report uh, that said the body arrived at the back, excuse me, the body arrived at 635. 635, that absolutely corroborates Dennis David's account. And so now we have a document that says 635, which is wonderful that corroborates everything Dennis David was saying all those years. We wouldn't have that document if it wasn't for the Assassination Records Review Board and the fine work done by Doug Horn. Uh, he's the one that actually retrieved this through the pile of oh, what, hundreds of thousands of documents in this case. There's a whole story about how he got uh, in touch with Boyajan and got Boyajan to send him his onion, a copy of his onion skin of the report he wrote a few days after November 22nd. So we have the time at 6.35, corroborates Dennis David. Mm. So then when you, if you're a researcher on this, it's like I start making up lists. How many big crash bag? How many people saw the black hearse at the back? Who knows the time? And you, 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 we now have a pretty good picture. And that picture of what happened at Bethesda then forces us to extrapolate back to what must have happened in Dallas. Because, you see, an empty casket at the Bethesda front entrance means an empty casket on takeoff from Dallas. Can't overemphasize the importance of that statement, but that's an absolute fact, because Jackie's always with the casket. So if it was empty on takeoff, it was empty on arrival. When Johnson is being sworn in Reverse. at the front of the, of the aircraft, who was oh, unaccounted the, the for? Yeah, well, that's a fair question, and uh, I don't really have a great answer to it right now. There are people of trying to compare this and photographs to the manifest and say who's unaccounted for. Um, and I can't give you a great answer to that right now. I really can't. Um, but, I mean, clearly something's going on. And I also want to say Please. that even if there's one or two agents who are cooperating, yeah. getting the body out of the coffin, which there have to be, by the way, um, that doesn't mean that everybody who's doing that act knows what's really going on. Uh, and I have reason to believe that Lyndon Johnson, first of all, they didn't do that without Johnson knowing. Lyndon Johnson ordered the president's body to be removed from the coffin. I can tell you that right now. No agent on the United States Secret Service, and these are GS-15s or whatever they are, uh, takes it upon himself to remove the president's body. And who, whatever excuse was given, you know, uh, as a security measure, I think, by the way, the same way Johnson lied and said, Bobby told us that the flight has to be delayed while I'm sworn in, I am sure, without any question, and I have some evidence for this, uh, that Bobby, that Johnson's using the same line that Bobby, you know, justified transferring the body 
um, doing this for security reasons, to keep the body away from the Dallas Police Department who may want to retrieve the body so they can do a Dallas autopsy or some story like that. The bottom line is there are agents who are involved in the removal of the body from the casket who do not understand the full implications of who do not understand the full implications of what they're doing because they don't know the whole context. Now that doesn't mean that, but somebody has to know. And I'll tell you one thing, Kellerman has to know. There's no question in my mind for based on a whole variety of evidence that Kellerman knows exactly what's going on, that this, as I said at Bismarck, North Dakota, is a body centric plot. The purpose of this whole scheme was to change the diagram of the shooting immediately or as soon as possible after the shooting to make it appear that the shots came from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository and that Lee Oswald is the assassin. That's the whole purpose of this thing. This purpose is about mm -hmm. creating a false narrative so that the line of succession of the United States government will operate properly and Lyndon Johnson will become president of the United States. That's how this works. Okay, uh, David, here's a question just in. Now, I had mentioned Dr. Robert McClellan before and uh, what he witnessed, and there was one autopsy photo he witnessed that he said it wasn't like the body at all, and that was the autopsy photo where he believes the flap at the back of the head was pulled over. Now, besides that particular autopsy photo, he said the rest of them are more or less what he saw at Parkland Hospital. Um, if, if we follow your thesis according to the question I have in front of me, um, how do you square that peg, if you will? Because, well, uh, go ahead, please. Well, first of all, you know, I'm not familiar with what Dr. McClellan is saying in the year 2014 or 13. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with it. I interviewed Dr. McClellan sure. on camera in 1989, and I had no difficulty with what he said then, uh, we're many years after that now. But what's more important, I called up those doctors. I interviewed them in 1966, right. in, in the fall, and in 1967. And the other wound on the body, which is very important to know about, is the wound at the front of the throat. Bingo. Dr. Perry, who I interviewed, I think it was October 27th, 1966, the late Dr. Perry, said to me, that the tracheotomy incision he made was, quote, two to three centimeters. This is all described in my chapter 11. Why is this important? Two to three centimeters, and it had smooth edges. Perry did not know, apparently, when I spoke to him, that that's not the way the body arrived at Bethesda. At Bethesda, according to the autopsy testimony, the uh, incision was, quote, seven to eight centimeters and had, quote, widely gaping irregular edges. It's a completely different looking thing at Bethesda than it was at Dallas. So we're not only dealing with the condition of the uh, back of the head, we're dealing with the way the throat looked. The throat had an entry wound, according to the Dallas doctors mm -hmm. um, at Dallas, but by the time the body reached, and then he put a little incision through it to, for the tracheotomy tube, two to three centimeters, which I had confirmed from Carrico, who was standing next to him. I interviewed him the next day or something. It's all in Chapter 11. By the time this body got to Bethesda, it was an ugly gash. And according to Paul O'Connor, the esophagus was laid bare. It was open. It was really ripped open. Terrible, nasty damage. Then, sometime that evening, it was sewn shut. Now, I don't want to make this sound like a Boris Karloff movie, but that's what happened. It was sewn shut, according to the radiologist Ebersole. Now, so Ebersole is looking for where there's an exit for the supposed entry at the back of, of the body, and he's taking one x-ray after another after another. And then he says, oh, word arrived that there had been an, a bullet wound there. So that's, I guess, when they broke the stitches open, you see. And he said, oh, that ended my necessity to take x-rays because now I know a bullet exited. The point is there was a period that night in which the body was sewn up. That is, that wound was concealed by sewing. And that sewing took place after the body reached Bethesda Naval Hospital. So... There's complicity at Bethesda on someone who sewed up that wound because Ebersole is a fine witness, and he knows about the sewing. So you go through these different stages with the neck wound, and that's what I wanted to point out to your radio audience, that uh, we have a, um, a wound of entry at the front of the throat, that's a small right. trach, then it's enlarged, and it looks like someone was in there probing around, trying to fish something out, and then uh, it's sewn up to hide that bullet wound, they don't get a, somebody doesn't get away with that. I don't want to use the word they because I don't know who they are, but somebody sewed that up. David, you, is it possible it was sewn up because originally 
Mrs. Kennedy wanted to have the body on display and then she decided no? Uh, those explanations would be fine if it was done by the, um, the, the funeral home. That's oh, after the autopsy okay, ends. Yeah. yeah. But this, this all happened much earlier in the evening. Uh, sewing up a wound at the time of the autopsy is a, ba a really crude and brutal and ridiculous mm. uh, de deception. And they didn't, somebody didn't get away with it. So it wasn't and, for cosmetic reasons? Then. No, no. Okay. It was sewn up and then, and then, uh, and, and, the, and then when they, so by the time the autopsy photographs are taken that become the evidence, the, the, it's a wound again. There's no sewing anymore. But okay. if, you, if you read my chapter 3 on the sewing, excuse me, chapter 23, Ebersold is very credible. And he goes on and on about how confused everything was because there was this little tracheotomy incision that had been right. stitched shut. And he was positive. I mean, he knows all about the stitches. Okay, and, uh, David, we're going to bring Bill in. Bill's got a, a couple of questions for you. Bill from Lake Tahoe. And also, I want to get you to plug your new book. Let's bring Bill in, and you can plug the book right away, David. Bill, welcome back. Thank you, uh, David. Yeah. Um, uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy is uh, right. standing next to Jacqueline Kennedy as the coffin is... Uh, coming down the, uh, the, the gangplank or whatever you want to call it, um, you might want to make references. How the heck did Bobby Kennedy get on Air Force One? Bobby Kennedy wasn't in Dallas. And then the other one was in your book, The Assertions of Admiral uh, David um, uh, Osborne, which I think is very revealing as to what went on in the autopsy room and what he saw. And this is an admiral in the Navy, and the uh, uh, assassination committee report uh, in later years, wanted to poo-poo what he saw uh, as being, you know, someone who was old and, and derelict and didn't know what he was talking about. You want to make a couple of comments on those two assertions? Well, okay, let's start with Admiral David Osborne. Um, according to the House Select Committee, he was right there at the autopsy. He was head of surgery or something when uh, a, a, I think it was a little bag was brought into the room with pieces of bone or something and a bullet. And it was a perfectly clean and whole bullet, and he said he held it in his hand. That was my chapter 29, and I'll tell you truthfully, I didn't try to integrate it with the rest of the data that night because it's like an outlier. It's, um, there's no reason not to believe uh, Dr. Osborne and what he witnessed. It just tells me this, this manipulation of evidence going on. There's this extra piece of the bullet, extra piece of the puzzle, excuse me. And this, they haven't decided, or somebody hasn't decided, where this bullet fits in. And so there it is. It's being held by Osborne for a few moments. It's right there in the room, and it disappears from the official record. We just don't have any record of such a bullet being held by Osborne in the room. And, you know, obviously Osborne should have been a star witness at the time of the Warren Commission, and it would have exposed this whole mess. People would have said, well, where does this piece fit? And the answer is it, it doesn't fit in the official version. Um, as far as Bobby Kennedy goes... Um, you know, the official version is that he ran up the front of the plane when the plane landed, and that's why he's at the back of the plane at the offload. I have my serious doubts about that, but I don't want to get into that on the show right now. But Bobby Kennedy knows that the coffin is empty. Okay, I'm telling you that right now based on my evidence, which will be in my new book, Final Charade. There's no question in my mind. When I wrote Best Evidence, I believe... Did Bobby order the body altered? No, I don't think he would ever do such a thing. I've asked myself that question, by the mm -hmm. way. Uh, it would be Lyndon Johnson's dream to be able to say, oh, yes, I was told we should, we should falsify the autopsy because of A, B, and C, and Bobby's involved, and that's why I did it. I think that he would like to have people believe that, and I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I shouldn't speculate on this, but I mean, I don't know what documents. We don't know what documents are still unavailable, but anything could have happened, and all I'm saying is that, no, I think that's a basic deception that Bobby does not know about in terms of the flesh and bones of his brother's body. No, I don't think so. Okay. David, uh, given the timing of the events and how close they were together, the fact that the body would have to be altered before, it, at or before Mrs. Kennedy arrived, there's that 20-minute difference, and it was tight already, is there a chance that the body may have been removed to the fuselage and altered there, right on the yeah. airplane? What, in flight? Yes, no, I don't think it happened in flight. I, I really don't believe that um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, I have, I think I have good evidence that it happened at Love Field. The, the, the original, what I call smashing and bashing. Let me be very clear. The president's head was a mess. 
yeah. when it arrived at Parkland Hospital. It was an unstable skull. If you touched it, moved it around, pieces fell to the table. There was a second wrapping on the head. When did all this happen? I personally believe it happened at Love Field, the smashing and bashing, at Love Field between the time so, the body was offloaded and the time it was then put into the luggage area before takeoff at uh, 247. Bill, you have a question? Well, yeah, uh, David, you said uh, the smash and bash happened at Parkland. Uh, no, no, not at Parkland. I said at Love Field. Okay, Love Field, okay. It's very important that it happened at Love Field. And, um, now, now, on the, the plane or off the plane? No, no, at Love Field prior to takeoff. I see, but on, on the, the plane. At Love Field, well, if you ask me, could they have had a big truck there? And could it have been inside a truck and then put inside the luggage? I couldn't rule that out, but I personally uh -huh. think it happened at Love Field, at plane side, or inside the plane, and then it was, and, 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 and the blood trail I'll be discussing, and I discussed a little bit at Bismarck, but I'll be discussing more of, because there was a cleanup of Air Force One that night that took hours and hours, and I know about that because I have a witness to it. Okay, so, I want to talk about that, but I want you to plug your new book as well. Well, my, my, book, my new book has not been published yet, okay, and I'm finishing it now. It's called Final Charade, and Final Charade really deals with not just, uh, it does not only deal with the sequel to Best Evidence and the kind of things we're discussing tonight on the show, but it deals with the whole issue of Lee Oswald, who he was, why he was in Russia, who he really was, and, uh, and, and, and also the whole political theory behind this assassination, which, which I also talked about at Bismarck, which is that this whole thing is not about a second assassin or a third assassin. This whole thing and this alteration of evidence is all about uh, creating a narrative, a legitimate legal narrative, which makes it appear that one man shot the president so that the line of succession will operate, the vice president will become president, and Johnson's big fear that Bobby Kennedy would stop the succession will not happen. And that's what he talks about. Johnson talks about that in an oral history I found at the LBJ library, his fear that Bobby was going to stop the succession. And believe me, I think Bobby, you know, had those ideas. Certainly Johnson said that he did, and uh, Johnson was worried about it. So that's what this is all about. Ultimately, was it Johnson pulling the strings, do you feel? Um, I, I think he has a major part in it yes i do i do but he's not this thing is very complicated the idea of m murdering the president in a motorcade first of all and then dealing with some things like the automobile the body and all this stuff johnson i mean even if he's the chief beneficiary of it even if he was briefed about what was going on this is like producing a movie you have an executive producer, line producers, uh, and, and of course above the executive producer are the people that put up the money, the sponsors. So it's like a three-level thing. So it was, do I think Johnson was briefed beforehand? Yes. Do I think Johnson pulled the chestnuts out of the fire when the plot originally, as originally designed failed and things went wrong? Yes. Um, could he have done this? Was he sitting in the cockpit of this whole operation and saying, do this, do that? No, he's not there. He's in a motorcade. Somebody's got to be running the show. David, in your opinion, you said when things went wrong, what were some of those things that went wrong with the plot? Well, uh, we, we, I don't think we could get into all of them on this show, and, and it wouldn't be appropriate just on a radio. One, just one, that's fine. Okay, one. Well, the president's car stopped during the shooting, and films had to be altered to hide the fact that the president's car stopped. Uh, all the, most, so many witnesses say the car stopped. I interviewed a number of them in 1971, November. Based on that testimony, I have no question in my mind that the car stopped, and there are technical reasons for believing the film was altered. But I would be the first to admit that, in, that that's one of the deal breakers. I mean, if, if, you, if one can find out where those films were altered and how that was done, that would blow the whole Kennedy assassination thing sky high. And I believe that that's going to happen um, in the next five or ten years. I really do believe that. But, okay. but I think that that's an example of things that were not supposed to happen. It was not supposed to happen that the car came to a halt, but it did. Do you, do you okay. think the driver of that car was Will Greer? Do you feel that he was involved? Uh, that's a really interesting question, and I spent an evening with Greer at his mm -hmm. home in uh, November, in, in 1971, and I don't think he told us the whole truth, but I'm not prepared to, you know, to say exactly what yeah. the truth is about him. But he's a complicated guy. And I think all of the, let me just put it this way, sure. all of the Secret Service agents and the White House detail, most all of them, I believe, know what happened and they were given some story and they've made the decision to carry it to the grave and I call that the race to the cemetery. And they don't care anymore. It's not that they don't care about Kennedy or didn't, 
but they've decided that if two investigations or whatever, the United States government isn't going to reveal this, they're not going to go starting to blow whistles, which could cause them hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal fees to go and defend themselves from some prosecutor who was going to say they were part of a plot. I think that's where we are today. I think you, you very well could be right. Folks, uh, our guest tonight, David S. Lifton, the book is called Best Evidence. He's got a new book coming out. Got a working title? Final Charade. Final Charade. I'm going to write that down. Final Charade, folks, you can get David's book, Best Evidence, because Final Charade has not been published yet. Uh, at www.nightfrightshow.com, www.nightfrightshow.com. And, and tell them about Please, go ahead. Yeah, they can Google my name, David Lifton, and look on YouTube for the video. I made a video a documentary in 19, um, it, it was released in 1989, and we're going to have a video channel up on YouTube soon, but it's already excerpts of it are up on YouTube. Terrific. Where I, where I interview these witnesses at Bethesda in 1980, fall 1980. Dennis David, you'll see, Paul O'Connor, uh, Gerald Custer, Aubrey Reich at the Dallas end of the line. You'll see all about the body not arriving in, in Bethesda the same way it left Dallas. The same way it left Dallas. The, yeah. yeah. Bill, did you have a question, my friend? Oh, Bill's not there. Okay, folks, we're going to continue along here. Now, what has always amazed me is that this assassination took place we triangulated fire, maybe even more than that. Maybe there was other locations in Dealey Plaza as well. But there was also a police department right there in the plaza. So this thing had to be coordinated, if we're to believe that it was a coup d'etat, uh, with a lot of players involved. Is it that difficult in your mind to coordinate all these players? Person yeah, I think it's a very complicated operation. Mm. And I think that... Um, when the truth comes out, we'll see that the key, the key thing here is to drive the car very slowly through uh, what I have always viewed as like a free fire zone. Yeah. And w when I say producing a movie, you've got to make sure that, you know, Oswald is not, you know, into dentist or seeing a bank officer about a loan at the time because then he couldn't be um, framed as the patsy. And uh, that's very important. This whole narrative revolves around Lee Oswald as the assassin. You know, all of, in a nation of 150 million people or whatever it was, Oswald, in 1963, Oswald was one of, what, 15 defectors and the only one with rifle training. I mean, the notion of him being on President Kennedy's, uh, in Dealey Plaza, on the mm -hmm. parade route mm -hmm. is remarkable. And so the whole issue is who is Oswald and how did he end up there? And so he has to be controlled. So that's part of the problem. And the other issue or the challenge and that for, for the assassins. And the other issue is not only to control him, but to make sure that the shooters are not seen. They have to be somewhere, and there's not a single... I, I mean, sure, there's some smoke and there's noises, but nobody sees the shooters. And then the car has to be going very slowly. It can't be speeding through at 30 miles an hour, which it wasn't. Uh, so all of these things, that's why I said very similar to producing a movie. And then when things go wrong, then there has to be swift action taken. You need so, an executive producer to uh, to pull it all together. That's right. That's yeah. right. You do, and it's very and it's you know I, I, the more you talked at the beginning of the show about Mark Lane um, and the mm -hmm. book and the movie yeah. Executive Action. Yeah. I by the way I was the researcher on Executive Action. My name is in the film credits, and I wrote the the uh, the document they handed out at the theaters when they showed that movie. Oh, terrific! And, yeah, I should get a copy of that somewhere out of storage and um, scan it. But um, the more I look at the assassination today, the more similar it looks like <laughs> the fictional version we put forward in executive action. <laughs> but you have a bunch of guys sitting around with a bunch of TV monitors yeah. watching what's going on. But, I mean, to control this event properly, you need to deal with the Associated Press, the UPI wire service. If you get the uh, UPI wire service, the original teletype printer, which I have, you realize that three shots were fired, is put out on the UPI wire, Within uh, three minutes, within three minutes, the official story is being put on the UPI wire by Merriman, by Merriman Smith, who's riding in the two cars behind uh, JFK's car. Uh, three shots were fired. And that, to me, is ridiculous compared to what was actually heard in the plaza that day. Well, the kids today won't realize this, but there was no cell phones. How was he able to do that in three minutes? Well, yes, yeah, the innocent explanation, the innocent explanation is, of course, that he heard three shots and he simply reported what he heard. Uh, I don't think that's the explanation in this case, but that's my opinion. And I've had extensive correspondence, by the way, back in 1984 with Merriman Smith's widow. 
Gailey Smith. And you may not know this, and I'll just tell you, readers, Merriman Smith committed suicide oh. uh, in 1967 because his son was killed in Vietnam. He was a oh, helicopter pilot. God. So he lost his son in Vietnam, and then, and he was, I think he was a heavy drinker, but anyway, he committed suicide. And uh, he was connected with, and I have correspondence to prove this, he was connected with Admiral Calvin Galloway, the head of a Naval right. Hospital, the head of the Naval Medical Center there. So I have letters from Gailey Smith and things like that. Um, but he's one example of a manipulated press. Um, and I think Merriman Smith, uh, I'll, I'll say this right here now in your program, do I think Merriman Smith had foreknowledge of President Kennedy's assassination? Yes, I do. And he's not the only one. So, uh, you know. why, do, why does the mainstream press, you know, we're having a great conversation this last, last two hours or so. Uh, that we've been going over this. The mainstream press, you were just talking about being on the Canadian CBC, yeah. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. They had you up, they interviewed you, and then they put out this hack piece discounting all the conspiracy people, and they're throwing them all into the same basket, saying they're all a little bit loopy, if you will, and they have no credence. They all believe in 9-11, that it was a conspiracy. They all believe in UFOs, yada, yada, yada. Why is the mainstream press continuing this, what I would call, attack on legitimate researchers? Uh, I, I don't have a great answer except that, um, you know, there, there was a researcher, it reminds me of a conversation I once had with Jeff Cohn, mm. who, and, and I used to, I had this opinion that, well, you know, if you just get the right evidence, you can convince these people. And he said, you don't understand. And, you know, he's kind of a leftist, and he said, these people, you know, the person that I was calling these people, and we were referring at the time about Dan Rather, by the way. Okay. We are talking about Dan Rather, um, that they wouldn't be in the positions they're in if they thought the way you think. They don't think. They don't have that kind of turn of mind. And I had an experience with Dan Rather. I was alone with him in a room really? for, for well over an hour in 19... Um, when, my, when, my, okay, when, we, when we interviewed yeah. the Bethesda witnesses uh -huh. that you'll see on that video... Uh, his exe his producer was came up to our editing room and said, "Oh my God, Dan's gonna love this stuff. Wait till Dan sees this." Well, when I showed the film at sixty minutes in a in a screening room mm -hmm. to Don Hewitt, he was hostile in the beginning. Said, "Where did you get these witnesses? Did you pay these people?" And I said, "Yes, a dollar for the release." You know, the, you know, and, and and that was my retort to his 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 criticism. And then he said, "Well." Then he came around and said, okay, we have to get a producer to do this. And they set up a meeting between me and Dan Rather alone for over an hour. He watches all the witnesses, and Rather, the lights go on, and Rather looks at me, and he says something like, um, well, I don't understand why anybody would want to alter the body since Oswald shot the president. Something like that. It's unbelievable. So the evidence is right in front of him, and he just negates it all. And he goes negates back it all. To the, it was very peculiar. To the party and, line, if you will. Yeah, he was on the party line right away. And, that, and that's what I think is at the root of, of these problems. And then Dan Rather told Brian McKenna of the CBC, and I learned about this 10 or 20 years ago, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a restaurant in Rome. They were having dinner, and, 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 and Rather says to McKenna, I have a private opinion and a professional that's opinion right. about the assassination. Yeah. There is the problem. Yeah, I know Brian as well, and uh, that's the thing, yeah, because like I said um, – you know, if you believe in the Kennedy assassination, uh, assassination, all of a sudden you get classified as a loopy person and uh, you're not reasonable. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's a big, big problem. Folks, we're speaking with David Lifton tonight. Uh, we're talking about his book, Best Evidence, and we're also looking at um, the fact that the body was indeed uh, altered uh, somewhere between Love Field, as David says, and uh, Bethesda when it was there for the autopsy. I've got a, a little note here that says there's a problem with this call. This is Skype, by the way, folks. Hold on while we try to get your call back. So let me just uh, see if I can get David back and bring him back in. I hope it's not me. There we go. Hey, Brent. Hey, how are you? I think it's David's Skype. Uh, Bill's here with me. Okay. And I just want to let the audience know that apparently we're having some issues with calls coming in to you. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to try to help resolve that issue this week uh, and um, maybe produce your show starting in the future so that we can make sure you don't uh, lose calls. Because I thought that you were missing calls uh, over the last uh, you know, few weeks. 
So we're going to try to get that resolved. There was a 650 phone call that came in, uh, which was redirected to um, a man who's monitoring the calls, a mad painter, and he was not able to grab that call for you because uh, he's off off this call. But anyway, so 650 tried to call in, and then also if anyone's trying to Skype in on Freedom Screen 2, apparently we have a, a slight issue on this show, so we're going to try to resolve that over the next week. And I apologize for that inconvenience, David. I mean, I'm sorry, Brent. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. We've lost David, too. I hope we can yeah, find him. I hope Bill. we can get him back. So, uh, Bill. yeah, Bill, do you have any uh, <laughs> any comments to make uh, about well, David? No, I was just going to I was sure. gonna ask David uh, to... Uh, to uh, 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 talk about the uh, recollections of uh, James Curtis uh, Jenkins, uh, who corroborated uh, 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 Paul Connor's testimony. So I just I wanted him to talk about that. I, anytime you can corroborate someone's uh, uh, testimony is very important. Uh, being an attorney, uh, that is best evidence. Boy, he took some shots at attorneys tonight, didn't he, buddy? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> You weathered the storm, my friend. You're in there. Well. Everyone saw me put it one time or another. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's continue on the JFK thing. Angela, I've never asked your opinion on uh, JFK's assassination. What do you <laughs> well, think? You know, because you're kind of from a different generation than, you know, the, the boomers, if you will. And uh, what are your I'm opinions? Actually, I'm actually below. I'm generation. I'm Gen X, baby. Gen I'm Gen X. X. Anyway, uh, you know, well, it's interesting to be uh, married to uh, a JFK expert, if you will, mm -hmm. or a tour of the truth, and uh, you know, and to get to know the people that Bill has interacted with regarding this. Uh, you know, I've become aware of all of these things because of my, um, uh, because of my, uh, you know, close proximity to um, a JFK buff. And uh, actually, there's an individual in the chat room right now. I found a uh, Sack Town Owl. He's a fan of my show and also just a doll, and uh, has the best evidence book. Uh, so I just I wanted to uh, point out that anyone in the chat room, I will point out your questions to David Lipton if he comes back on today. And if not, I, I hope that you guys are able to interact in the future. For me, um, you know, I'm a conspiracy theorist in general, and I, I find that David's evidence is incredibly compelling, you know, best evidence, that type of thing. You know, my husband, before he met David, uh, was already telling me about this whole thing. And, you know, I, I did. I came from, I, I was born in 1969. So the time I was aware of anything really was around the time of 11, you know, where you're actually paying attention. Oh, to oh David's back. Do you have oh, that question for him, uh, Angela? I, I do not, but yeah. maybe Bill does. Uh, uh, David? Are you still with us, David? Yeah. Or? Oh, great. Welcome yes, back, my friend. Welcome well, back. It's good to have you back. Um, okay. Angela was just telling us that uh, she was around the age of 11. Uh, when she when she got into the uh, JFK assassination. Now, as time runs down, folks, I want to jump to Ted Sorensen. Now, Ted Sorensen, I was able to speak with on the telephone several times. I interviewed him on the telephone. Then, when I was down in New York City doing um, uh, some interviews with Nobel Peace laureates, I uh, called up his uh, his handler, if you will, and asked for a meet and greet. Ted was kind enough to meet me in his Manhattan apartment. And uh, for a kid coming from a working class neighborhood, figure the projects, that's me. Walking into a Manhattan apartment was something else. Ah, oh, we lost David again. Um, all this to say is uh, I was able to interview him for the last time as he d passed away only four weeks just after that. And some of the revelations he made were stunning. He was ready to unload. And it was a fabulous interview, and I've put those into a book called JFK Assassination from the Oval Office to Dealey Plaza, www.nightfrightshow. You can go there and order the book. And you can also order David's book, Best Evidence, there. Just look for the uh, the uh, the book cover uh, associated with tonight's guest. Yeah, we got a problem with – are you back, David, my friend? Yes. Have you got the cat running on your keyboard or something? No, I don't know what it is. I have no idea. <laughs> You know what it is, David? It's national security. Every time we talk about the Kennedy assassination, they get on you. They're probably monitoring us right now. That's my theory. It's got to be. I, I suspect that. Ted Sorensen, David. We were talking about Ted Sorensen yeah. the other night. Um, what are your thoughts and feelings on Ted Sorensen? Well, uh, it's been a revelation to me. as I, I've always known about Ted Sorensen, of course, and I've read about him and read his book and everything. 
But what's really amazing to me is the realization how close he was to Kennedy and that he's not just a speech writer. He is, a, Kennedy called him an extra lobe of my brain. He was that close. He was like a hyphenate. Every time Ted, every time Kennedy writes an article for the New York Times, that's written by Ted Sorensen. That's right. All of that material is written by Ted Sorensen. He hired Sorensen in January 1953, and the arrangement was that he would do a few articles for him, and he would keep the money or something like that. That all starts in January 53. If you go to the New York Times website and start to go through, and I did this a few weeks ago, there are many, many articles written not only in the New York Times, but in other magazines and in, even in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. They bear John Kennedy's name, but it's like he has this fabulous brain and fabulous writer on contract, and sure, they work together. Sure, it's Kennedy's concept. Sure, Kennedy instructs him what he wants done, but I'll never think of Kennedy the same way again because all the printed material coming out, it's co-written. It's like Ted Sorensen, excuse me, it's like John Kennedy with Ted Sorensen. Uh, that's just the way it worked. His speeches, everything. He, he's an integral part of Kennedy's uh, presidency. Uh, Sorensen by himself could never be, seek political office, and Kennedy by himself would never have the speeches and the writings that are under his name because he co-wrote all that stuff were instructed Sorensen, so Sorensen's writing all that material. So yeah. that's the way I think of it. And I would argue that they had this symbiotic relationship and one would not have been the person they turned out to be without the other. And I always think of what Ted Sorensen was to JFK was what Paul Martin was to the Beatles. Uh, Paul Martin, that's Prime Minister in Canada. George Martin, forgive me, folks. <laughs> it's a c Canadian stumble there. <laughs> I, just got in, I just got in a book, which I ordered from a website, which was published in 1960, called Front Runner Dark Horse by Ralph Martin, by mm -hmm. the way. And anyway, it has, it's all about the 1960 nominating, race to the nomination, and they have a chapter on Sorensen, which is wonderful. And he talks about all of this material, and uh, that for Sorensen, Kennedy was his work of art. And for Kennedy, I forget how he put it, I mean, Sorensen is the great enabler, the great literary enabler. I mean, sure, Kennedy's smart, no question about that, but I'm saying that all those speeches, the famous speeches, are all co-written, from what I see now. And uh, the book, the recent book by, published by Jeffrey Sachs, To Move the World, about the speech that Kennedy gave at American University, Yeah, that's also... I'm sure that's the, uh, the the work of both men together. It's not as if Kennedy. It's not as if Sorensen is a ventriloquist and, and speaking through Kennedy. The, the point is they're co-writers. They coexist. Although and, it was you know your, it was pretty close to that. Uh, Kennedy made very few changes. He trusted Sorensen that much, and he trusted Sorensen so much that he tasked Sorensen with the biggest task the world has ever faced and that task was to write a letter to Khrushchev to get him to pull the missiles out of Cuba and he did that and he saved the world and he told me personally he said he was scared this folks because one wrong word one way if it was interpreted another way it might have pissed Khrushchev off and the missiles would have been launched I mean we're talking about Khrushchev now, all these years later, but don't forget, Khrushchev stood in the United Nations, took his shoe off, and slammed it on the table over and over and over again, shouting, we will bury you, we will bury you. So imagine that taking place today if that was Vladimir Putin. Right. <laughs> you know, it's the same deal, folks, you know. So we have to be ever vigilant, and uh, let's hope before we arrive at a situation like that again, uh, people will take heed to what Ted Sorensen wrote and his uh, idealism. And that was the thing he told me he shared most with Kennedy, was his idealism. Yes, and what, 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 you told me, did you not, uh, last week, that um, yeah. Sorensen talked about when we might know the truth about the forces behind the Kennedy assassination. That's did right. You, did you talk about that yet on your show? Uh, no, not yet. I was uh, waiting for the revelations for that, actually, David, when my book comes out in uh, three or okay. four weeks. But uh, certainly uh, I will be talking about that extensively because it is not only American history but world history. Um, basically, folks, in my opinion, he confirms conspiracy, and that's coming from the inner circle of JFK. And all these years later, um, he confirmed that, in my opinion, and I'll leave it up to you to decide for yourself if that's indeed what he was saying. So uh, 
he passed away. You're gonna you're gonna find this funny, David. Uh, I interviewed him September 18th, 2010. He passed away October 31st, 2010, only a few weeks later. And he passed away because of a second stroke it he took just after getting off the phone with the White House. Now, he was still on call at the White House. I guess they were searching out different ways of, of using him, um, uh, you know, for uh, for his ideas. Let's face it, he was the guy that was behind settling the Cuban Missile Crisis, and Kennedy trusted him and wanted him in on that, even though he had no foreign policy experience. And, you know, McNamara said that it was Sorensen that pulled them all together. If you've seen the movie 13 Days, it makes it look like um, it was Kenny O'Donnell that pulled everybody together, but McNamara said no, that was indeed Sorensen that kept everybody together. So, and thank God it was resolved peacefully. Um, but, you know, also, go ahead. the movie um, that just came out a few months ago, uh, the documentary called Kennedy, A Presidency Betrayed. Uh, you can just Google it on the Internet. It was reviewed in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Morgan Freeman is the narrator. But he talks about, you know, the whole problem with Kennedy being at war with his national security apparatus, where a lot of these, you know, these bureaucrats and other people who didn't have his view. I mean, he was absolutely determined to keep us out of war. And, you know, Kennedy, the thing you have to remember about Kennedy is what happened in the Pacific with him in PT-109. And I recently reread... His brother. Yes, but but yes, but specifically him and Pete... Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. His brother was blown up in an airplane because he volunteered for this very dangerous mission. Kennedy was in a PT boat. He got rammed by a Japanese destroyer and was instrumental in saving his crew. But there's a story... The whole account of that originally was published in 1944 in the New Yorker magazine. I'm a subscriber, and I recently retrieved that from their archives. And it's really an amazing really account is. by John Hersey. And you realize what he's made of. I mean, you know, this guy was swimming three miles, four miles in the Blackett Strait, carrying a canvas strap in his mouth, towing one of the fellow people on board who was injured. Yeah, he was burned. Yeah. I, swim, I swim laps at the UCLA pool, and I'm telling you, if I can do a mile... I'm, I'm, it's great. If I can do a half mile, I'm frankly happy. But to swim in the ocean with sharks, towing somebody for six miles, that's, I mean, that's, that's the kind of guy Kennedy was. Absolutely. He's a hero. And once he got to the island, there was an island in the Pacific as well, folks, that he brought the survivors of this. Uh, the PT boat was rammed and split in half virtually by a Japanese <laughs> destroyer. Once he reached the island... Uh, he turned around and went right back out into the Blackett Strait because he wanted to hail uh, any shipping that was passing. That's and right. he had to tread water all night, all night, right. with, and no was. water at all, no water at all. All he had was seawater, and he couldn't drink that. So here he was dehydrated, and he'd gone through all that, and he, he had the chutzpah, if you will. <laughs> I love that word. <laughs> to go right back out there and then came back in. Yeah, so therefore, when he is up yeah. against the military advisors and after the Bay of Pigs, when he realized That's that right. a lot of them were just full of bull, yep. he no longer just believed. And, you know, he – look, I grew up waiting for the other shoe to drop with regard to Hiroshima and the A-bomb. I said this is going to end with the New York City being destroyed, other major cities. And I still wonder about whether that could happen. But the fact is that he had those same fears. And he was a child of that war, a veteran of that war. He had his own children. He wanted his family to survive, and, and, his, and he realized that he had to do this by somehow respecting the other side and making peace with it. That's what the American University speech was all about, and that's what the book To Move a World by Jeffrey Sachs is all about. I mean, that, he analyzes that speech and what happened and what a marvelous speech it was. So anyway, that's... And, you know, uh, just to reiterate, uh, Ted told me that the threat of a military coup was very real. Oh, that's very important. Crisis. He told you that in the final yeah, interview? He did. He did. And uh, he talked about specifics, uh, Curtis LeMay, things he said that were actually captured on tape. Most people know they were captured on tape at this point. And uh, General Shoup as well. And uh, how they were trying to force uh, Kennedy's hand and go into war. And uh, even Curtis LeMay um, insulted him, saying that uh, Kennedy was just like his father, those types of very he's, very treasonous things yes really he said yeah. that on and he, he said, said that it, on that, tape just the yeah. words he used the word now, that it was very real kennedy had left at the XCOM meeting but he yeah. had a tape recorder in there and quote unquote he forgot 
to turn it off. Yeah, right. Any, right. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he did. <laughs> Anyways, right. uh, he wanted right. to find out what they were saying behind his back because he was afraid of a military coup. And yeah, he said, you know, it's as bad as the appeasement at uh, in Berlin, yeah. at Munich. I'm sorry, I said Berlin. Yeah, and uh, so that you know, very treasonous things. So, uh, anyways, but Ted said Ted, Ted Sorensen told you that the. That Kennedy thought the threat of a military coup was "quote unquote" very real. Very real. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you know they were dealing with a lot, and they were afraid also of a military coup in Russia, in the Soviet Union, because uh, it looked like Khrushchev wasn't in control either. So both sides were battling their military um, hawks. Right. And a very dangerous situation where you get two militaries with machoism and everything else, and you're trying to bring this thing to a resolve peacefully. So, Brent, we should not leave out uh, the, the movie Seven Days in May. Oh, that's a terrific movie. And he alludes to that as well, by the way. Well, wait, wait, well the point is that we sh you should tell the audience, we should all know that Kennedy helped make that movie by making the White House available that's so they right. didn't have to build sets. Yep. This is my understanding of it, and this all that's happened right. in 1963. Uh, and I forget the director's name right this moment, but anyway. Uh, I, I, um, oh, Frank, yeah, and he was a friend of Frank and I think, and he was a friend of Bobby's afterwards. Yeah. Uh, at Bobby was in his house that afternoon before he was killed. Yeah. And if, you, and, if you, and if you go to the New York Times microfilm, the first frame before, the last frame of November 22nd, the last frame before you hit the big headline, Kennedy assassinated in Dallas, is a full page ad for seven days in May with a tagline that says something like, could it happen here? I mean, <laughs> could, I mean and then you turn the page and there's Dallas. Oh but I'm amazed that Sorensen said that. Right? Yes, it's really amazing that these guys really understood the dynamic of what they were surrounded with and they were worried about it. Completely. And this is one of the reasons um, I feel he uh, he fired the Joint Chief of Staff, what's his face, and, and he rehired, or not rehired, but he brought in, um, oh, Bobby's friend. Oh, my Max God. Maxwell Tail Max yeah, Taylor. Max Taylor. Yeah, yeah. to keep an and eye on these guys. How about, the fact that, how about the fact that Bobby Kennedy tried to get the Secret Service transferred from the Treasury Department over to the Justice Department so it would be under his, you know, he wasn't successful in doing that. They, yeah. they sensed something. Look, they sensed something. Oh, I yes. Was, Agreed. And, Completely. And, and he was constantly, his favorite poem, it was being read to him at night by his wife, I have a rendezvous with death. In September, he talked about it to his doctor, about the fact that I will not live in fear. And the most dramatic evidence of all, I think, is Labor Day 1963, when out at Hammersmith Farm, which was the Jackie Kennedy uh, property, he staged his own assassination. Did he really? I didn't know that, David. Yes, it's a, it, as a joke. We can talk about that sometime. Yes, and he filmed it, and it was witnessed and reported, But and, and, and then Pierre Salinger got really mad at the people who were reporting it. I Look, Kennedy knew something was afoot. There's no question about it. The, question, the issue is, did he know what that something was? And the idea of the military marching in and taking over, see, he had the wrong concept because that's not what they did. Instead, they manipulated, the, the system was manipulated to make it appear legit, that it was totally a quirk of fate. And that's where you have to know about Oswald and how he was manipulated and how this whole thing in Dallas worked. That's what was done. It's the same kind of forces, but the, no armies moved. Nobody marched on the White House. It was manipulated from within by using the line of succession ordained in the Constitution to, to change leaders. Folks, our guest tonight, you know, the music's going to start any second. Our guest tonight, David Lifton, the book Best Evidence, his new book, Final Charade, not published yet, but you can get Best Evidence at www.nightfrightshow.com. Bill, Angela, thank you so much. Angela has a show on Revolution Radio every day at 5 o'clock. Um, that's 5 o'clock Eastern, so it would be uh, three hours difference, 2 o'clock uh, uh, Pacific time is going to say Western, <laughs> and I better run. David, I have enjoyed this talk thoroughly. You will not Thank be you a stranger. Me too. Take care, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you, friend.